had the honor of sitting to the right of uh, His Majesty King Abdullah II of Jordan at a dinner in uh, the Dead Sea. When the conversation took us to the need for an Arab think tank for the region, but one with a global reach, you're the one, everyone said around the table, uh, you have to build it. They had looked at my background as a journalist, international journalist, and then they thought that I know enough about think tanks and that I could take that challenge for exhilarating challenge of reinventing myself into someone other than what I had been for all my life, that is, a journalist. I had been working as a journalist for about 35 years, based at the United Nations. I worked at that time as senior diplomatic correspondent, bureau chief, and commentator, columnist for Al Haya. I'd been on television for uh, not only LBC, you know me here with LBC, but in the States, in New York, it was CNN, MSNBC. So I had been a very busy person doing uh, my job as a journalist, uh, dealing with international political affairs. Um, upon my return to New York in Manhattan, I embarked actually on reinventing myself to become the founder of a cutting-edge think tank for the Arab region. My daughter, Thalia, was preparing herself to go to Columbia University. And, uh, well, we had almost broken our relationship by me insisting that she needed to be part of this project of building a think tank. I thought it was going to shape her in a special way. So she endured a mother who insisted on making her feel the process of building something. And I think now she's grateful that she was part of that process. I had been to Tangiers, and I found a compact uh, desk that I had them pack, and I said, let me take it with me to New York. I took that compact desk, I placed it at the entrance of our living room, and uh, I embarked on building brick by brick a think tank that I called Beirut Institute. Beirut Institute has been built patiently and determinedly by one woman, and Beirut Institute is now, a decade later, a highly respected global brand. Um, we don't have so many women in this region, in the whole of the Middle East, who have founded think tanks, who have really convened global minds to come together and think about the future of this region on multiple uh, levels, actually, not only the foreign policy or political affairs, but really a policy about where do we belong, where do we go from here, how do we move forward. Um, the think tank convenes and then we produce a set of recommendations, and this set of recommendations is sent and delivered to policymakers. That is the work of a think tank, so it's important that we have them in the Middle East, and it's important that a, wom a woman had been able to build one, because normally the geopolitics are basically largely thought of as a man's domain. But from the very beginning, I simply wouldn't have it. So, I dared to dream it. I dared to take on the challenge of building it. I dared to surmount the difficulties and I dared to withstand the discouragement. I dared to differ. I think it's very important to dare intelligently. I think if we lose the purpose of where do we uh, go with this daring, I think we lose the purpose of daring. Uh, to dare irresponsibly and haphazardly is to defeat the very purpose of daring, the very notion of daring intelligently. So let's call it maybe the art of daring, in order to dare, one has to have not only a purpose, but also the determination to reach that purpose. So as foreign correspondent in New York at the United Nations, at age 23, I took my time to learn the complicated landscape of international political affairs. I was surrounded by men who were very eager to belittle a young woman who dared enter their field. This was geopolitics, after all. It was reserved for them. 
So what did I do? I observed the inner workings of international diplomacy diligently. I invested myself fully in learning the intricacies of covering the United Nations and international matters. I educated myself very patiently, and then I dared. I dared to ask questions and do follow-ups as well, dared to push the envelope, dared to hold their feet to the fire. In other words, I dared to be a serious journalist. Using the United Nations as a springboard for uh, covering international affairs, I went off to the world, different capitals, conducting interviews with presidents, with leaders, uh, covering summits, breaking major stories. By age 26, I had been interviewing the likes of, at that time, the mighty Philippines President Ferdinand Marcos, who really literally sat me on the floor where, meaning a chair on the floor, while he sat up on a pedestal in, in a premeditated setting conducive to intimidating me. When he told me angrily, after having asked him a set of very tough questions which he didn't like, when he said, young lady, your time is up, my answer was, Mr. President, actually, my time has just begun. At age 26, I also had my, de my debut at uh, the Makhdil Lahra News Hour, it was called, which was a great program on PBS in the United States that was quite famous for being a serious show. So here I was, 26 years old, speaking about the revolution in Iran. I went to Tehran to interview the president and to Havana, to Belgrade for the non-aligned summits. I went to, the, uh, to Moscow for the 27th Party Congress and for the Gorbachev-Reagan meeting. I conducted interviews in prison in New York. All through this journey, I dared to put my foot in the door dared not to take no for an answer, dared to use the most important tool a journalist could have, which is the right to ask questions most pointedly and most responsibly. I conducted, I would think, maybe over 30 interviews with heads of states, over 100 interviews with foreign ministers. My purpose was not to showcase my capabilities, but rather to get to the point, to extract the story, on behalf of my readers, but to do so most profoundly and most responsibly. Uh, I became known as a formidable interviewer because I was quite tough. Uh, I was an interviewer who dared to ask the right question and to insist on an answer. So I was feared, but I was respected. What I didn't want to, to be remembered as was simply that uh, here is a journalist who is a good interviewer who asks questions. I wanted really to become someone who has her own point of view and a column, uh, so someone who's recognized as an astute and a serious strategic columnist, someone who thinks uh, on, of geopolitics as a man does or differently, but a woman who's allowed to think of geopolitics. So I decided to become a strategic columnist on geopolitical matters. It was necessary, of course, to break yet another glass ceiling. So the, you could imagine the boys at the paper in the beginning resisted because that was their own domain. A woman was not to be allowed into this reserved space for uh, strategic affairs, for political affairs, for international political affairs. But I dare to persevere and to be persistent. So I won the battle. I became a better columnist than most of the men uh, in the Arab world, actually altogether, and then also on the international level. What I'm trying to say, had I feared the wrath and the revenge of those few that would have interrupted my career, I think I would have accomplished their mission, not mine. The fact that I feel not has made all the difference. What I'm trying to say that it's important to fear not 
under so many different circumstances, not only when you're a journalist. I feared not when letter bombs were 15 minutes away from my mailbox in New York. I feared not. When I received warnings and death threats and don't come back to Lebanon, I feared not. When sent on a plane to Damascus with an annulled passport, without informing me that my Lebanese passport has been annulled, I feared not. When attempts were made to force me to appear before a military court, I feared not. I think only once I broke down. Uh, it was really after I had answered all the questions of the FBI and the journalists having received these letter bombs in New York, four of them, God was by my side when I went to the security at the United Nations and I challenged them to go find out if there are bombs in my mailbox because they had been received in London and uh, Washington of Al Hayat offices. Uh, luckily, they traced them and they found them before they exploded, four of them, and I would have been torn to pieces had I opened one of them. This is when I broke down, when I thought of my five-year-old daughter being told that her mother had been blown to pieces and she couldn't even look at the corpse for closure. I did not break down when a certain general decided to silence me as a journalist who dared to differ with what he was dictating to the media around him. But I had from his point of view, to be silenced. He needed to silence me in order to intimidate the young men and women who wanted to be independent journalists like me. He needed me an example for them that they fear, they fear not to be like me, that they would fear what would happen to them if they had been like me. So severe measures had to be taken in order to accomplish his mission. He sent me on a plane from here, from Beirut, to uh, Damascus. I was accompanying the late UN uh, Secretary General Kofi Annan on a tour in the region. So he sent me uh, on the plane with my Lebanese passport secretly annulled. So had I not been an internationally recognized journalist, I think I would still be rotting in prison in Syria because I entered the land there with an unknown Lebanese passport. But I think the general, the Lebanese general, had in mind to show young upcoming journalists what will happen to them, to those who dared to differ. Even after assurances were given to Kofi Annan that uh, uh, the passport will be returned and uh, everything will be fine, well, just guess what happened? An indictment was sent to our offices here in Beirut. As you remember, I was in New York at that time. So the indictment said that I was accused of, quote, dealing with the enemy because I debated an Israeli while defending Lebanon in a televised debate. It was not in secret rooms behind closed doors. It was televised in defense of Lebanon. And guess what two of my male colleagues decided to do when they received the indictment? They decided to handle it. They are the men who could deal with it without me knowing about it. An indictment. So had I not learned accidentally that I was indicted and had come to Lebanon for a funeral or for a wedding, I may be actually still rotting in a woman's prison here in Beirut. But I refused to bow. I refused to appear in the military court accused of dealing with the enemy. I am Ravida Dharam, I said. I will never stand in court accusing me of dealing with the enemy. I will never, ever stand accused of such travesty. He who manufactures such a charge must be the one who drops it. That's what I demanded. And that's what he did. And history was made. History was made because a woman dared 
to stand up to the wrong. History was made because a woman dared to stand up to such an assault on the freedom of the media and on her own credibility. Dared to share, dared actually not only to stare back, but to stare down a general. Dared to be brave, a brave woman who refused to compromise on matters of right and matters of dignity. So I did beg to differ. Any time I am awarded or recognized by an award anywhere in the world, I always say, I dedicate this award to a young girl, to a young woman who is thinking that she would like to be where I am standing. And watching me with thinking, where am I going with myself? till I reach such a place. I say to such a girl, I say to her, fear not. Dare think, dare dream, dare speak up, dare stand up. Dare believe in what you are. And be bold, be forthcoming. I have a daughter that I raised, who is now 28 years old. I raised her to dream. I raised her to dare dream, to dare explore, and to dare make mistakes. I have your back, I always said to her. And the beauty of it is that now, my Thalia, my daughter, is the one who has my back. This way, we dare be adventurous. This way, we dare be courageous. We dare to dream and to help carve our destinies. This way, we dare to reject intimidation and bullying and to win wars, not only battles. This way, we dare to have a vision and a purpose and to intelligently reinvent ourselves, breaking in the process yet another glass ceiling. This way, we dare to smartly differ and to profoundly make a difference. Thank you.